be fine. Blowing up like dynamite, I never meant to... Hello and welcome to This is Ibrox. My name is Scott Patterson and welcome to your weekly episode of all the good stuff that we talk about Rangers. Joining me as usual on the pod this week is um, fellow podder Tommy McIntyre. Thomas, good evening. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you guys are too. Indeed. And a special guest, really pleased to welcome back after the chat we had with him and Lauren Scholar a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Dean Furman joins us on the pod this week. Hi, Dean. Good evening, guys. Great to be back on again and uh, always a pleasure to talk everything blue. Indeed. Thanks for taking time out to, to join us because we appreciate you've got your, your hands kind of full of nappies right now. So we really appreciate you taking the time to come and join us. They're not full right now, I have to say, although we can't see them, but I'm sure they are. Yeah, no, no. If they are, please don't clap. Um, <laughs> we the, uh, we the important point, but uh, yeah, let's swiftly the on. Tommy, I'll come to you first. Um, last Thursday, we had match day four of our Europa League campaign and it was the the second of the two big games, which everyone's seen as big games in the group against the Portuguese giants, Benfica. Uh, Two each on the back of the three each trip over there. And I think immediately after the game, there was a bit of frustration at the fact that we've got so close in both of these games and we've not taken three points from either. I think Steven Gerrard managed the situation really well and, and and tempered the enthusiasm, shall we say, of the fans with his, with his post-match comments. What did you make of the game in general and, and Gerrard's comments at the end? Yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, and I'll, I'll just turn them round if you don't mind. And, yeah, of course. And take the latter one uh, at a run first. But I think the, the point that Steven Gerrard was making, and we've touched on it before, is the expectation setting. So there's already enough pressure in that dressing room on these players yeah. in terms of what they're trying to do domestically. And then you've got, because of the way that they've, by and large, outperformed, you know, it's a team that's put together on a relatively small budget, certainly compared to the likes of Benfica, yeah. who have consistently, because of their talent, their application, being drilled tactically really well, have punched above the weight. You know, and certainly going to Benfica scoring three and then scoring two at Ibrox is, is punched above your weight. So it's all about expectation setting because uh, by and large, these teams are supposed to be better than us and we're performing really well. And then going back to the game, it was hard not to hear the final whistle and be a little bit frustrated because you go you know, against anybody, you're 2-0 up at Ibrox, you've got what, circa 17 minutes left, if I remember correctly, uh, and then you, you scored an OG, which was pretty bad defending, um, and then a bit cut open for the second one it's a good finish and, and you think ah oh, we should we should be seeing it out but then like I said you take a step back and you go managers handled it really well expectations if somebody would have said to you two two games against Benfica you'd take two points and you'd be disappointed with the two draws I think by and large you'd be, you would have been happy with that and you know within the game itself Rangers more than held their own and were well never out of sight um, Benfica were a good team but did enough to get to get their point. Really good performance. Rangers can play football. Dean, from a from a footballer's perspective, for one of the guys that are, is on the pitch and maybe played in in Portugal before and then had to play the, the game against Ibrox against a team that everyone largely expects you to almost struggle against. Um, how does the mindset change after perhaps giving them a decent going over in their own place, but not coming away for the game and then doing something similar at home? How does that affect on the on the guy's mindset? Do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great measure of where the, where the team's at um, to be going toe to toe and being disappointed with with two draws against Portuguese giants who yeah. generally do relatively well in in the Champions League. Um, I think that that's a fantastic measure of of, of where the team is currently, and it, it kind of almost goes back to um, when I was at Rangers, and and you're talking of. Um, I always always remember the Champions League campaign, and it just the, the first name that springs to mind is Alan Hutton. Just how he was he was unbelievable in that in that Champions League campaign, yeah. and it, it's it's a great measure of where you are as a team that you can go toe to toe with with a well established team with a team that is probably one of the favourites of the, for the competition, um, and that should give that should give the team huge huge confidence. Yes, disappointed. Yes, you, you, you want to be winning, especially at home. But to be in that position, to be feeling that they should take great pride from it when, when they get over the disappointment of, of getting pegged back in both games, 
when they get over that disappointment and, and learn maybe a few lessons um, that I'm sure the manager will be taking them through, I think it's, it's fantastic. It, they'll be in a, in a fantastic frame of mind knowing that they're on a level where not only are they doing so well in currently domestically, they're also on, a, on a playing at a level where they are matching the very best that Europe has to offer. Tommy, I want to speak to you about Kemar Roof. Um, I think when he came in, everyone was kind of unsure about what his role was going to be. I think there was a lot of people that said that he could, could play up top on his own or he could play along either of the three positions if he were playing up 4 2 3 1. Um, scored an absolute beauty um, last Thursday night. But I actually felt all in all, his gameplay was absolutely superb. He was almost unplayable last Thursday night. Yeah, um, and he's. There's no doubt in his intelligence as a player. Yeah. I think that's probably the first thing that people notice. Uh, you know, his, his movement, his ability to drift in and out, pull players out with him. Um, it's, it's quite clear for everybody to see. His finishing's obviously there for everybody to see as well. Yeah, it was a uh, in terms of shifting it. Then he takes it on, shifts it on his right foot and then whips it into the top, the top corner. If I recall correctly, I think he used to play off the left-hand side for Leeds. Yeah, um, kind of on his right almost. Yeah, under yep. Bielsa. Um, and then Anderlecht, I think he was playing through, essentially directly through the middle as well. But I think when you get players like that, and Morelos is maybe slightly similar as well, um, when they're sharp enough and they're smart enough, which they undoubtedly are, um, they can play right across the front. That's a mark of a good player, isn't it? That they're not stuck in just one, one, um, one position. And that's not to say that players who just play one position to <laughs> Arlen. Let me roll back on that comment very swiftly, actually. Um, uh, this is coming from a guy who's only ever played, you know, I don't know. Uh, fives. At, at a snail's pace. I, I fives at a snail's pace. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, but there's no doubt he can play up top. I think the important thing for Reims as well is when they've got that, they've also got people feeding them and getting beyond. So you see people like Scott Yarfields and stuff like that helping out it's the movement and the transition and the rotation of that but your point was to came our roof he was an exciting buy for a reason we'd seen the finishes and we'd seen him do it at the highest level he's now hopefully going to stay injury free and deliver that for us and speaking strangely enough to, to dean's point there as well you know as much as i'm a big fan of the scottish league and all that we know what some of the external views are um are of it much like alan hutton's you know, stellar season in the Champions League. That's how people add numbers to the price tag. When you're yeah. doing it against the European opposition, you're doing it live on the big, you know, Wednesday or Thursday nights or whatever. That's all good for Rangers because ultimately everybody's a saleable asset. Aye, it's all a good news story. So I think I seen I, I seen something shortly after the game to say that Benfica spent circa one hundred million pounds in the summer and we spent seven. So the 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 difference is incredible, and I think. Dean, you've kind of alluded to yourself there for us to go and, and hold our own both in Lisbon and then and then back in, in Ibrox is a huge feather in our cap to um, the way the club are playing just now. But I think a, a special mention has to go to Stephen Gerrard and his coaching staff and the way that they're, they're pulling the, the players through in these games on a weekly basis just now. Yeah, before I get, get to the manager, I think it's interesting you you mentioned the figures involved i i one of my very good friends is is the left back at wickham joe jacobson yeah. um and wickham of what they've done is 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 incredible and i said to him how are you getting on how are you finding it and he said like you're in the championship but you're just playing against footballers you're a footballer you're a very good footballer and you're playing against footballers who are also very good and you raise your game to it so well, there's a price tag that benfica have spent but as a player yourself as soon as you cross that white line it doesn't matter if the guy costs 40 million who's playing up against you. You've got to back yourself that you're a very good footballer. You're playing for a huge, huge football club and you have more than have the ability to match them. And, and that's what my, my friend is finding in, in the championship. And if, if Rangers have gone out with that mindset and if the manager has, has given them a mindset, at the very end of the day, he's a winner. Yeah. Plain and simple. And, and you can see in his interviews when, when he's not happy, um, he wants to win. He wants to win in style, and he wants to win. He wants to win everything. Um, and I think that attitude, mentality, and based back based on the career and the play, he has rubs off very, very quickly onto his players. And I'm sure within his recruitment, he will only be recruiting players who have that same mentality. 
because if you don't if you're not going to follow his mentality then there's no point in you playing for a club like Rangers under the stewardship of of Steven Gerrard yes. you're just in the wrong place so uh to have that as the focal point to be looking at that to be listening to him to be learning off him every day on the training pitch it can only inspire you to be a top top team and and um it seems like very quickly that's what Rangers are are getting back to Tommy you'd agree now that Four games in, the two tough games of the group are gone, surely. Well, d- definitely. Um, I, just before I answer that, I should say, because it's a hobby horse of mine as well, uh, and I know Dean was alluding to it there, shout out alongside the management team to the analysis uh, team and the recruitment <laughs> team because of all that due diligence that goes on behind the scenes of making sure that somebody's got the right mentality to come in and, and back themselves, as, as Dean was saying, because you can't have people that, Start to question just because they're pulling on a bit, the big jersey. Yeah, um, great. But uh, yeah, you would have thought Benfica home and away are going to be the hardest games. I still think left Poznan away it will be a tricky tie, even without yeah. the fans. They're yeah. not as bad as people were making out. But I would like to hope that we'll do the business against Standard Liège, Ibrox, and then it's it's not a must win or a must get points from. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, Benfica home and away with everything that was there, and and they showed it. You know, Benfica are a really good side, really well drilled. Um, and I think Stephen Gerrard, after the, the game at Ibrox, had mentioned, yeah, we could take them on in that, you know, those two games or whatever. It's performing like that and performing like Benfica do as consistently as they do. That's where you end up winning, winning your, your titles. And consistently doesn't mean, or doesn't have to mean, playing stellar football and scoring worldies from outside the box or 50 yards or anything like that all the time. It's consistently getting the points in the bag, getting back up the road, and then come the glamour part of the season, at the end of it, you're in amongst the silverware conversation. That's what consistency means. And so far, so good on that. We just need to carry it forward. So before we move on to the, the, the game on Sunday, where, where we played Falkirk in the League Cup, I have to say a special mention to PZ, who scored Benfica's second goal, and also I think it was Gabriel. Um, who played centre mid. That's a terrible reference, that, Sorry. by the way. I'm going to have to edit that out. She Dean, played, she, so much for staying quiet. <laughs> there, she, she played centre mid. No, I thought I thought the boy Gabriel in the centre part for Benfica was absolutely outstanding. I thought it was really, really good. Um, and as, as I say, the boy PZ, who impressed in Lisbon, um, was equally impressive when he came off the bench. Um, two good players that they have there. Um, as you say, Tommy, Dean, you've, you've referred to yourself. These guys are going to be up there may become the end of the, the tournament and they're going to they'll progress from our group certainly alongside ourselves hopefully and you would imagine that they would progress certainly through to the, the semi-final stage potentially Yeah it's, it's, it's actually an interesting one I'm just going back onto my experience of continental football um, and what this what where Rangers might be feeling um, I went we, we went into the, the equivalent of the Europa League in Africa it's called the, the Confederations Cup and in our group was TP Mazembe, who are um, they're, they're one of the giants of African football. And for whatever reason, they fell out the Champions League into the Europa League equivalent. And we had them in our group and we went there and I think we were 2-0 down within five minutes. We ended up drawing 2-2 and we were in, um, in Congo. It's a very, very hostile place. And we got applauded off the pitch for how well we played. And we drew with them nil-nil at home. We both both progressed from our group. And it was the fact that we went toe-to-toe with the so-called Giants. It gave us so much belief that we said, well, hold on. We've just gone toe-to-toe with the favourites of the competition. Why can't we go Why can't we go on and on and on? And eventually we got to the final, actually met up with TP Mazembe again and lost on, we lost 2-1 on, on aggregate. But it just shows you what a, what a performance and what a, a it, it just lets you grow into the competition and it, it gives you that belief that, hold on, we are going toe-to, we should have beaten them. We should have beaten TP Mazembe. I know it's, a, it's, it's slightly different, but we should have beaten them. And it just gave us so much belief to say, who do we fear? Why, why should we fear anyone? If we can go toe-to-toe with the best, we can go, go all the way in this tournament. And I hope that's, that's maybe something that, that the Rangers team took away from, from those two games. Tommy, Sunday afternoon we travelled to Falkirk, literally a stone's throw from, from where I am right now. Um, League Cup, Betfred League Cup, second round. Um, 
Falkirk have, are on a relatively decent run of form, sitting top of their um, division, Division 1, just sitting above Cove Rangers. Um, Stephen Gerrard was able to make quite a few changes, including introduction of, of the four it in started. Um, I want to speak to you about Calvin Bassey. Uh, and I think a lot of people largely see him as a natural replacement for Barisic. To see him start at centre-half was a wee bit eyebrow-raising. I thought it was excellent on Sunday afternoon. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Held his own absolutely very well indeed. He did. You know, you know, we talk about Calvin Bassey all day. I'm a, I'm a big, big fan. And when Borna Barisic, you know, what number one choice left back for uh, the Croatian national team, um, bids will come in, I suspect, in the in the summer, and it's all about finding the right the right value for Rangers and then potentially selling them on. As much as I, as much as I love him, um, Bassi is a natural kind of successor to that. He'd also played, or call correctly, centre back for some of the Leicester reserve games as well. So it's not an unknown position to him for Bassi to play centre back, yeah. uh, left sided, obviously. Um, and it gave Helander and Balogun uh, a rest. Would he have naturally played there if it wasn't for Nikola Katic being out with a you know a long term injury, and then George Edmondson making a mess of uh, making his a mess life. Of the rules, uh, and his life, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then probably not. What you might have seen is ba- Barisic out, Bassi at left back, Edmondson in at centre back, um, and then once the game was won, and you may very well touch on this, so I won't wax too lyrical about it, but the likes of Leon King and stuff like that coming in as well. It's great to see growing our own. You know, Bassi coming up from Leicester at a young age, it's nice to see our youngsters getting in there as well. But yeah, he's a very, very good player. What I was really impressed with from the moment he's come in is he's obviously a very big, big unit. Right? He's, he's got the, the physique, um, although everybody looks like that to me, obviously. Um, <laughs> this is not an exercise chair, it's just a normal one. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, but it's the fact that he's very capable at the back and stuff like that. But he's also really natural going forward. Carries the ball really well. His final product's actually been really good as well. It's not as if we're dealing with, I mean, some rough elements. He's got to learn you know, when to get tight, when to go back, uh, etc. But yeah, he's a really, really exciting prospect. I'm with you. I thought he played extremely, extremely well. And he's, I've never seen him not play well when he's come into the team. That's, that's really encouraging. Dean, I know you never saw um, the game yesterday due to club commitment, club commitment rather, with, with Carlisle. Um, Jermaine Defoe scored with his first touch of the ball in, in open play, I'm sure. And um, we were so lucky to have someone with him, someone like him rather, at the club. Um, it would have been brilliant to have him sort of three, four years ago. I think he looks outstanding now and, and just as fresh. He's probably lost a little bit of pace by his own admission, um, but was really impressive yesterday. Um, and to, to score with his first touch just shows what a, what a, a clever striker he is. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the goal. Um, it it just sums him up. He is just a natural finisher. Yeah. He just knows where the goal is. I mean, I spoke to Bongs. I, I when I saw Bongs at national team, I was like a fan. I was like, oh, what's the throw like? What's Gerard like? Um, <laughs> and uh, Bongani just told me that every day he practices finishing, finishing, finishing. And I know that's what the best do. The best they just want to get better. They just they always feel no matter no matter what age they are or where they are in their career, they always feel they can get better. And I wasn't surprised when Bongs told me that Defoe's always out uh, practicing his finishing uh, because one, you see it on the pitch, but two, just that top level of player that he has been for a long, long time in his career, they always feel that they, they've got more. They've got that they can, they can keep on working. They can keep on improving. Uh, I was lucky enough to see that with Frank Lampard when I was a, a youngster at Chelsea. Of course. And I, I, Defoe is, is from a similar um, upbringing and you can just see his attitude to the game is so refreshing and he just loves goals and, and it's no surprise that he's still banging them in. It's funny you mentioned the 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 Lampard um, similarities. I'm going to come back to that in a wee while. Tommy, I want to speak to you about um, Bon the well, Barisic. Before yes. you go into Barisic, my, my apologies. Go um, for it. Just to throw in a stat to that. You know uh, I love a stat, right? Yep. Jermaine Defoe started... 29 games for Rangers. Do I, either of you, both of you, want to take a punt at how many goals? Uh, 25. In? I'm going to go, he's, he's, could be one in one, 29. 29 games, 10 assists, 28 goals. Oh, there you go. Incredible. 
there you go. And that's for a guy, and Dean, you'll be able to, you know, tell us how difficult it is, particularly at the top end of the pitch, not starting every game, coming in out of the cold every now and again and still just, still just buying them in. Just yeah. incredible. I just, yeah, just wanted to illuminate that start there. Absolutely phenomenal. And as you say, the remarkable thing about that is that he's he's kind of, he's used in he's used a wee bit sporadically, yeah. but he, he he never ever ever fails to to do the job. He never fails to do the job, and I think that's that gives Stephen Gerrard almost a bit of comfort if he was to look to to sort of manage Kemar Roof properly. If he if he didn't think Cedric Eaton was was up to playing through the middle himself, and he wanted to rest Morelos. Um, Jermaine Defoe will do the job for you. There's no question of that. Well, a, a quiz question the other week when we beat uh, Aki's 8-0 at Ibrox and Jermaine Defoe was on the pitch and was not on the score sheet. That, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a quiz question right there. Oh, dear. Like, like Barisic. So, um, you've put me off now with these numbers. Sorry, my apologies. Um, I was waiting for the right moment to do that. He stepped up and struck an absolute beauty of a corner right in the postage stamp um, on Sunday. Uh, and I want to come back to him in a wee second about his assist for for Tavernier for the fourth goal in the game. Uh, Barisic has, has, I think, been... More recently, he's been back to himself. He looked like he had a wee bit of a dip in form, I felt, round about the international break. However, um, he does look like he's he's got his game back together again and has proven to be quite important and pivotal for us in our success this year. But definitely, I think there's no great... Surprised to hear me or anyone else say that Rangers utilise, you know, very very forward thinking fullbacks. You know, you've got Barisic on the left, you've got Tav on the right. We just spoke about Calvin Bassey. You know, he's expected to get forward. Nathan Partlson, I would imagine, as uh, the understudy to Tav, would expect to get forward as well. You know, it is ridiculous when you see one fullback crossing to the other, the other ones in the box. Although <laughs> Tav, Tav gets into the box more than more than uh, Borna, I suggest. Yes. His technique is phenomenal in terms of that the work he gets from the ball. I mean, it is almost, I think the commentator was saying at the Falkirk game, it's almost like you expect him to at least hit the target and hit the target well. Um, such as his, his, his technique, it's, it's incredible. James Tavernier's goal return is phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how you find the words uh, for that. I agree with you as well, though, on, on Barisic to, to stick to the point. And I'm actually just going to kind of widen out and ask Dean a question as well, because... I thought he had a wee dip as well during the international break. And I'm just wondering, deal, uh, Dean, dealing with your, your own team and, and uh, dealing with the international uh, setup as well, obviously it's difficult going away from your club and, and all that kind of stuff as well. Just in the, the current environment when there's so many additional protocols from a COVID perspective, do you feel that that just, just throws out the rhythm a wee bit in terms of players? Are, are you finding that? I'm just quite quite interested in that. Yes, it's it has been kind of brought a new dynamic to, to the international week. I got tested five times in a week. Um, so that's once before flying. Uh, you have to be tested 48 hours before each game. So that's two games. Um, once before flying back again. And then once again, when I returned to my club. So that was five times within the week or 10 days over the international break. Uh, if any of you had a COVID test, you'll know that that's, that's not, not a good laugh pleasant. at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's um, down the back of the throat is the absolute killer of that one. Well, yeah, it's, no, it's not particularly pleasant to have it once, let alone five times. Um, it's just not comfortable, you know. It's, it's, it's masks, it's keeping social distance, it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not normal. It's just, it's just it's, it's a little bit... Yeah, it's strange. And then you get in your bubble and you can't really leave the bubble. You're, you, you're pretty much stuck in the hotel, which for, for South Africa, that is kind of how we do it. I know other countries or, or national teams might have slightly different protocols, um, but we are very much, we're, we're in the hotel, we're in our bubble. Um, so yeah, it, it can take you out your rhythm. Where, whereas, you, I mean, when you're playing for your club, you're on your own time after training, you go home, you go out, okay, not, not so much at the moment, but you can go out for dinner or it, you are on your own time. But even more so now with the international football, you are, it's, it's very, very strict um, within the bubble. So that can throw you off a little bit. Then it's the travelling. Okay, coming back from Europe isn't, isn't as daunting as, as um, what the African lads have to deal with. Um, but that, also, that, that does take its toll. Um, you're also 
something you're going to go and play 10 days a very different style potentially um you might at your club you might go be quite route one quite direct you go to your national team you might play out from the back and vice versa so you've got to then get back into the rhythm of your club team very very quickly because often your first training session after international break is thursday and you play on saturday so very quickly you take off your international hat and your and whatever tactics you were doing there and you've got to get back into what your your club manager wants you so it can take a few days maybe a week to get yourself back into the rhythm um, and that's often why you see you see internationals especially after traveling they they generally can miss that that game when uh, upon their return from international football just to get that rhythm back back in their legs i think that um the the break for baris that just passed has actually been quite good for him um i i think he was one of the players that was almost the the dip was was coming from a variety of a, a couple of things, but I think when the international break came, he, he, was, he was, I don't want to say dead in his feet, but I think he was almost knackered, and I think the break done him quite well. I don't think he played one of the games when he, one of the games. I don't even think he was on the bench for him with Croatia, but I think when he's came back, he, he's he's looked he's looked a bit back to his own self, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose a victim of his own success as well. When you talk about a dip, you know, there was that. There's a dip that takes you below the optimal. Aye, yeah, like, yeah, that's fair. Uh, you know, not your, your usual massive, massive standard. Um, and he's, I think a lot of the Rangers squad are probably in that second band at the moment that they've been playing so well that any deviation from that and people start to go, oh, he's, you know, maybe I had a, a dip or whatever. I, uh, yeah, I, I think he's, he's come back and he's, he's in a good place. I, I suppose one thing I've always... No, it's not always thought about it, but since Bola Barisic came to the, the club, um, he's one of those guys that strikes me as he, he likes to feel physically 100%. Yeah. And if he doesn't feel it, it impacts his game. Whereas you, I'd imagine, you, know, you get players who can stitch me up, I'll get right back out there or give me the injection. It's fine. I've got that. Whereas I just think, and it's, you know, it's not a criticism of him, you know, the, the, you know, an athlete having to perform under pressure, but... I always look at the feeling that any slight knock to Barisic's rhythm or indeed his physicality, and it just starts to work away on him a wee bit. Um, aye, and maybe that just, as Dean was saying, maybe that type of thing and being a bit, um, any excuse to use the word discombobulated. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, there we go. There's, there's, the, there's the Scrabble bell going. Um, the Soros. I, 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 I don't know how to spell that. I don't know what I mean. Um, <laughs> But I just, you know, just, just ties into what Dean was saying, you know, you go away, you do something different, you get a wee knock on training or you're coming yeah. back, flights, it's not your usual rhythm. I imagine that can eat any people's minds, but I, I mean, I'll take Barisic at 85% of performance, to be honest with you right now, because he's storming it, storming it. So the fourth goal of the game at the Falkirk was actually the one that I enjoyed the most, and I'll tell you why. Um, it showed that regardless of who we're playing, our, the way that we're, we're managing the game and the way that the fullbacks are playing are absolutely identical to how they would be against Falkirk, to how they would be against Benfica, to how they will be against Standard Liège and Ross County in the coming week. Um, right back and left back, battering up the pitch like their life depends on it. And we, we've seen that for the fourth goal when Barisic crosses it over and um, Tavernier with a beautifully crisp volley um, at the post. And as you say, I mean, for a right back to to be having the goal tally that he does, Tommy, is quite incredible. He will be player of the season this year. I think it'd be difficult to argue against him, and you know, just for the the purposes of everyone, if that was me volleying volleying that, it would have been at the corner flag, uh, and that'd have been that'd have been one in my of back way. garden. I one of those ones where you, um, I'm sure Dino will keep it right here. One of those ones where you instantly look at the studs and you pull out some of the grass and you go. <laughs> Something's happened there with my foot, and that's definitely not my technique. Um, but yeah, it's the fact he's there, I think he gives it in a shout, because Itten gets out of the way. Yeah. I think he's going to try and head it. Um, but I mean, you'll take, you'll take that any day of the week from a fullback, it's, it's unbelievable. And again, you know, uh, to, to say to, to Dean, I imagine there's probably different setups or different expectations when you go into a game. So for the like of Benfica, it's play them, get, as Scott was saying, get the fullbacks high and, and try and, you know, play our game with Falkirk I don't, again keep me right I would have thought there was more of a get high impose our game on them yeah. because we expect to grab them by the throat of the neck sorry the scruff of the neck where 
um, grabbing by the throat, scuff of the neck. So let's, <laughs> let's stick to one image at a time, sorry. Um, where, whereby, you know, um, aye, so with, with Benfica, it's a little different because they're going to challenge you. Whereas Falkirk, we just pinned them in. By and by and large, it was a bit scrappy. But do you sometimes, again, I'm stealing, I'm stealing Scott's hosting duties. No, no, not at all. But, um, but do you find that as well, Dean, when you're setting up your team, for example, as there we can get really on top of them and implement our style versus sometimes you have to let them come out a little bit? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like attack is the best form of defence. I think what, what, you're, what, what we have to really consider when, when you've got such attacking fullbacks is you have to look at your two centre-backs before you can have such attacking fullbacks because if your two centre-backs can't defend well down the channels and get exposed when they're pulled out of position, then you just can't have those that excessive overlapping attacking left back crosses it, right back scores, full backs. It's, it doesn't work. So then, yeah. then you take a step back and you say, right, if the left back goes, the right back stays, the kind of that kind of old school mentality. But the modern day full back is an attacking winger. That is that is modern day football. The the, the full back uh, is is could play right wing or left wing very, very comfortably. Um, but certainly you, your defenders and, and the, the, the tougher the opposition, the more they will get tested. Your, your, your defenders, your centre-backs have to be able to cover those spaces that your full-backs are going your, your full to leave open. So that's something that, that will be considered when you're setting up your team. What are my full back, What are my centre-backs like? Are they slow? Are they going to get exposed? If so, we don't we don't let our fullbacks go. Can they handle the channel? Are they quick? Can they can they deal with can they deal with a nippy striker down the wing? Um, yes, right. Now we can now we can really push on. We can give our fullbacks license to go. And it seems like the the fullbacks at Rangers have got full license to get forward. And and there's nothing quite like seeing a left back cross it to a right back. And and uh, in the modern day, that is uh, a manager's dream. So Dean, I'm going to stick with you as a, a centre mid. Um, how trustworthy do you have to be of your fullbacks if they are galloping up beyond you and leaving big spaces in behind? How how do you deal with that as a as a centre midfielder? As a, as a defensive midfielder, um, yeah, it's it's often me who has to take the responsibility when it all breaks <laughs> down and, and start start running uh, sixty yards back into into right back's position to make a tackle. Yeah. Um, but again, you want your fullbacks going. You want overlapping. You want overloading the defence, um, especially a team like Rangers, who are the majority of the time going to be dominant in games. They're going to be playing against ten men behind the ball, and they're going to be playing against teams who are very structured and very rigid and hard to break down. And if you're not creating overloads and overlapping and sending, taking a risk, if you're not prepared to take a risk. You're not gonna. You're not gonna break teams down. So yes, it is risky to leave maybe your centre backs exposed and maybe one midfielder to to be that extra bit of cover. But if you don't take a risk, you're never gonna break teams down. And in, in a game like against Falkirk, okay, this goal you're talking about was at three nil up. So Falkirk's kind of hope and and uh, maybe fight had been knocked out of them by that stage. Yeah. But in general. To break teams down that are sitting behind the ball, you have to throw bodies forward. You have to have runs in behind. You have to have uh, fullbacks uh, who are willing to get forward, who are who are causing problems all game. And uh, that seems like Rangers have got two perfect examples of that. Tommy, elsewhere in the country, when they were throwing crash barriers around, uh, we were able to throw uh, Leon King and Kieran Dixon on for their Rangers debuts at the weekend. I want to speak about Dixon first, if I may. I got the best part of half an hour, maybe even 40 minutes. Um, reminded me a lot of Scott Arfield in the way that he put himself about. I thought he looked really handy. And he, he certainly looked like he'd been, you could tell he'd been familiarising himself with, with the first team members. I, th- I thought it was really, really impressive when he came on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, two quick things. One, a, a, a hand clap for that uh, that link there involving the crash barrier, Scott. That was uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and just second, I would have been one of those fullbacks screaming uh, abuse at Dean, saying, why are you not <laughs> back there? That's not my fault. I'm, I'm staying up here. That's uh, your job. Yeah, I mean this caravan that I'm doing, <laughs> <laughs> staying up here. Um, so, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, these guys don't, uh, you know, Dixon, King, they, they don't, uh, or they weren't just included in the, in the squad. They've been socialised with the uh, with the first team. They'll, they'll have been training, they'll have been showing their worth. I think there's a couple of good things from it. You know, Stephen Gerrard's now shown that there's a, well, it continues to show there's a pathway. Yeah. Um, and the players will get their chance and it's about using it in the right time, in the right way. You know, it's, you know sometimes I feel that people want to see the, the bench packed with youth players. But that's, that's just not pragmatic. Uh-huh. Right, you just can't can't do that. The end goal is to have a sustained couple of players every year who can make the grade either our club or can get sold on for a profit. Really important. Look at Chelsea with their their loan process. I think they're uh, not to bring another club into it, but I think they continually turn the profit on yeah. that type of basis. Um, business model one one and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, yeah, I thought I thought he looked really Dixon looked really really good. Yeah, I get your Scott Arfield comparison. Um, Certainly not uh, not scared of a challenge. No. Always a good thing. And took to it probably the the good thing for me was didn't look um phased by the opportunity. You know, it's not just a cup game, he's not just coming on to make his debut and all that. He knows it's live on the T V, people have been watching. Maybe thankfully there's no fans in the stadium because that's added pressure for players, although yeah. I can imagine some players react to it well, but yeah, it came into knocked it, knocked it about really well. Some good challenges, some good play. Yeah, you know, best of luck to the boy and hope to see more of them. S- simple as that. Dean Bengani Zungu started his first game for Rangers uh, on Sunday. I think he got just over 70 minutes um, and looked extremely comfortable, um, both in his surroundings with the guys um, and also just the way he played with the ball at his feet. I thought it was excellent. Some of his, his passing through the centre of the park looked particularly dangerous. He looked like he had created quite a decent uh, rapport and relationship with Yanis Hadji dropping in to take the ball from him. Um, he's going to be a very good player for us. Now, I know you've spent some time with him um, recently on, on international duty. How is he finding um, settling in at Rangers? Uh, been a wee bit stop start for him, I think, taking into account... Um, I'm arriving and then international duty and then he missed the game there. Um, I assume he's enjoying it and, and settled in okay? Yeah, as you say, a little bit stop-start for him because when he arrived, he was in quarantine as well. So he yeah. couldn't really get going. A little bit frustrating. You sign at a club, you do the whole uh, shirt thing with the press and everyone gets excited and then you've got to go self-isolate for, for a week, two weeks. Yeah. Um, but what I do know is that he's absolutely loving it. Um, he's he's loving. I mean, as I said before, I was like a little. I was like a fan asking him about Gerard and Jimmy <laughs> Bell, the kit man, and and uh, <laughs> tell me about Defoe and uh, how good is Murray Park and what about Ibrox? What a stadium! Um, so I was asking him all the questions. I was very excited, but I can see in him that he's really, really loving it. Um, and when we when we last um, when we last spoke, I said to you that he's come from a club that. Um, uh, before he moved on to Europe, but in, in South Africa in particular, that have huge, huge expectations. Um, he plays for a national team with huge, huge expectations and a significant amount of pressure is placed upon us when we play for the national team. So Bongs is accustomed to that. So I don't see any reason why Bongs will will not... will, will I don't see any reason for him to go into there and feel kind of nervous or over, overawed or... Um, under too much pressure, he he is the type of boy that can deal with it, um, and he'll want to he'll he'll want to be a regular, um, and that's that's what he's about. He won't be happy sitting on the bench. He'll want to be playing. And uh, granted, it's a cup game, but if that's your first opportunity to really showcase yourself, yeah, um, you've got to take it. And um, it's great to hear that that you say he he looked comfortable. Um, what I noticed when, when he came and played with me in the national team, he was playing some fantastic passes. So that's another feather that he's added to, to his cap over recent years. Um, and once again, going back to teams, how I know they'll be set up against Rangers, bodies behind the ball, you have to have not only the ability to see it, but the ability to pull it off as well. And it's, it's those, those through balls, through the lines. Um, he's got a fantastic range of passing and, and I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to see that in his uh, brief period on the pitch. 
Tommy, he took a bit of an elbow from Connor Salmon <laughs> about halfway through the second half, and it was very much like a traditional welcome to the game up here, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't was it was it a was it an elbow or was it a header? I, d- I don't know. He, he he was in a bit of pain anyway, and as he looked up to Salmon, I don't think he thanked him for it. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't speak after a cancer and I thought that I uh, was well, certainly not as well as I, I used to, but uh, yeah, I'm sure it was choice. Like, like, <laughs> um, yeah, I, th- I think it was. A, I think it was a header, but certainly you know Connor Salmon's got. Um, he's he's a uh, your old style robust centre Indeed. forward. Shall we say? Mm. I actually thought. I mean, I, I thought um, Sengu played really well, and you can see his range of passing. I thought he was a bit um, ginger at the start in terms of the game, actually, and some of his passes were a little bit astray. Just for the first five, ten minutes, I thought that was maybe down to, and Dean Reid, I say, because I'd be interested to get the answer, I thought it might be down to the fact that he was playing on one of these artificial pitches, yeah, uh, which are a, a, a disgrace anyway. I don't think they should be there for, for real games, maybe training, but that's... Mm-hmm. He definitely won't have encountered that so far in Scotland because he, he's not played at Livingston or Hamilton. I doubt he'll have encountered anything. I don't think there's anything in France uh, that's that. I, I don't know. Are they prevalent in in South Africa or anything like that? Or is it all? I wouldn't have spe- expect so with the weather. Not at all. No, we we are very lucky that uh, what, ten years ago now South Africa hosts the World Cup. So generally, you are playing in beautiful World Cup stadiums with with fantastic pitches. Um, un- <laughs> Unfortunately for, for Bongs going on and playing against Falkirk on AstroTurf, our international game, um, we played a country called Sao Tome and Principe and the away leg was meant to be obviously in Sao Tome and they are on an AstroTurf. So that would have, that would have really helped Bongs um, get ready for this game. But for whatever reason, don't ask me why, we managed to convince them to play their home game in South Africa in one of our World Cup stadiums. So, yeah. So, so unfortunately for Bongs, he had no practice on AstroTurf and maybe it took him five or ten minutes to, uh, to, to get to speed with, with the surface. But not only that, I think um, when Bongs does get into, um, uh, into into some of the league games and, and plays, no disrespect to Falkirk, but against against some tougher opposition, yeah. it, it it might take him a while to get used to the league. It is a new country; it's a different style. Um, you're talking about Connor Salmon, Salmon giving him a little welcome to to Scotland. That's going to happen. That's something he's going to have to get used to very very quickly. But it can take a while to become accustomed to it. So that's something that that's part of the challenge. That's part of the challenge of settling in. Um, to making a name for yourself, how quickly can you can you really bed your roots? How quickly can you say, right, I've seen what this is all about. I can deal with it and still showcase how good I am. And and that's probably his biggest challenge uh, in his early in his early few months at Rangers. If I can add just just uh, two, I think Dean uh, Dean might oh he's back. Still just there. two very quick things. <laughs> as soon as you mentioned that World Cup. I instantly heard Vuvuzela, like tinnitus, in my, <laughs> in my mind. But I also just wanted to give a shout out for that um, South African home shot in that World Cup, which was an absolute cracker. cracker, by the way. There yep. we go. An absolute cracker. Even better than that Brazil one that's behind you, Dean. Um, <laughs> has that got an autograph shame, on it, Dean? Shame we, it does, yeah. Shame we don't have him in our... That is a Ronaldinho one, yeah. Oh, wow. Geez, that's, um, yeah, that's pretty special. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to that. That's, that was a, a top up, so to speak. A top up. So, speaking of changes of quality, we've obviously went from Benfica to Falkirk last week, and it's another rise, with all respect to Falkirk, it's another rise in quality this coming week when Thursday we welcome Standard Liege to Ibrox, Tommy. Big game. Um, win the game and we qualify out of the group stages I, I think quite comfortably and absolutely deservedly so it'll be a tie the players won't fear at all No absolutely not I mean this would be match day five Yeah um, I've, I've watched too much of UEFA and FIFA streams I've started to say match day Match day This is game five right That's <laughs> um, yeah, All bets are off now that's the way I'm starting to speak So um, yeah match day five and um you know, we went to, to our standard or Liège aren't a, a bad team. They're a pretty good team. And I think there were some misconceptions from the game out there as well that, yeah, by and large, we absolutely deserved the, the three points um, and we controlled large parts of it. They also hit the post and the bar where I think when it was 
they hit the bar at nil nil and then post at one nil. Yeah. So if, if that goes in or it hits the other side or whatever, all of a sudden you've got a slightly different game and they had a great home record as well. That said, coming to Ibrox where we've already beaten Lech Poznan, uh, went toe to toe with Benfica, and you know we've managed to take everybody else on at Ibrox. Yeah. I fully expect us to beat Standard Liège, qualify from the group, and be able to then maybe rotate a little bit when we go to Poland. Yeah. which is a really good thing as well. So some other people can get a, a little bit of a, uh, minutes in the legs or maybe some other youth players can come in. And as Dean was actually talking about earlier as well, maybe you don't take some of your key players to Poland so they don't have to do the travelling as well and be exposed to, to the, the risks that are there at the moment as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's... I'd be surprised if we don't win the game. That said, I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park. These are a pretty decent side. We'll have to do it professionally and earn the points. Dean, this Rangers team continue to to win, and I don't want to jinx them by saying almost every time they play. However, um, they they are definitely showing a, a real rich vein of consistency. As a as a player yourself, do, do you just find yourself almost accommodating a mindset and just sticking with it and thinking as you cross the white line, you've got your jobs to do. Let's go and get it done and, and win the game and get get back in with three points. Yeah, very much. Winning becomes a habit. Um, you do certain things so you, you run harder when you're winning you 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 fight a little bit harder you know when you're down in the dumps everything you, you feel tired you, you don't you, you feel like you lethargic lack of energy uh, little bounces aren't going for you but when you're winning you're upbeat um the dressing room there's a great buzz there whoever's playing kind of knows their job straight away it's not like anyone's forgetting their jobs and that's what happens when you're in a winning team it's it's a fan it's one of the best places to be because you just have that feeling amongst you that someone's going to produce a bit of magic because everyone's on top form uh people are going to be doing their jobs you don't need to worry about what other people are doing and you you can fully focus on your game because you know everyone is on their own game and, and they're on they're on the money um, and it is a fantastic place to be and, and long may it continue. And there will be times where it's, it's not as good as this, but I think with the depth and the experience that they have in that squad and the management, I think they can, they can maintain this for a long, long time. Tommy, same question to you. This team seem to have, a, they've definitely developed a, an ability to keep calm and ultimately just win games. Um, you would suspect as as the games continue to come and the the quality of opposition continues to vary. As I say, we've went from Benfica to Falkirk to climbing back up that ladder now to play a, a Belgian European outfit. Um, the guys just need to continue doing as they're doing, and, and they should be able to come away with three points on Thursday. Uh, yeah, and I'm glad you said you you didn't say you know. Um, carry on, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the, what do you call it, keep, keep calm and carry on. Yeah, yeah. Like, hate things. Was, I, my hand was starting to hover over the cliche bell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the hang up button. Uh, exactly, yeah, you were, you were well, Dude, you were getting caught off. Uh, I was going to stay on the line with you, obviously. <laughs> um, but, no, I well, team's, team's covered it as well. You know, success breeds success. And you start to get into that rhythm of trust, uh, I think Dean was touching on it as well, that even when a small blip comes up, no, it's a small blip, we'll shrug it off because we know we've done it, we've went toe-to-toe with the likes of Benfica, etc. We can go up and down. And I think the management team probably deserve a lot of credit and the players, because right? ultimately the players go across the line. There's only so much that tactics and all that can do. Ultimately, it's about, in my opinion, I'm a very old-school manager, which is probably why I'm not a manager, right? But, um, <laughs> But ultimately, you can do all the tactics and they have an Im- impact, but it's about you using your game and your talent to dominate your opposite number. It's all about those those moments and your belief that Dean was talking about earlier as well. I believe I'm better than you for the last 90 minutes. I'm going to show you why. Uh, and then we'll see where we are at the end of the game. But Rangers have shown they can do that. And as I touched on a couple of weeks ago as well, or we all touched on, it's the fact that people can cycle in and out of the team on rotation and there's no drop-off in quality. So I know that the guy has not played. Um, you know, I, I know that J- Jermaine Defoe has not been a regular starter. Is going to come in and he's going to make chances. Yeah. I know that Calvin Bassey is going to come in next to me if I'm Connor Goldson as a centre-back. And I'll talk him through the game because he's young, but I know he's talented. And I know there won't be a drop-off in quality. I'd imagine once you get that type of cycle in the dressing room and in the club, everybody's on a high. 
and everybody goes, that's fine. We will find the answers to unlock the questions that all these teams are going to pose us and we'll give them ones that they can't answer. That's where we find ourselves right now. Tommy, at the start of the season, I, th I think it's fair to say that everyone sort of winning the league was priority number one. Um, then you had sort of both cups and a lot of people probably said that qualification in the Europa League would more have been something that we would be quite happy to, to sort of roll with the punches on. If we progress to the group stage, it would be good financially. I just wonder at what point, now that we, there's a good chance we could qualify from the group stages, um, the support perhaps look at progressing further than the Europa League becomes more of a different carrot as opposed to winning our domestic championships concerned. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it's, it's very, I, I get your point and I, you know, I agree with it. It's very, always very simple for me. Win the league. Win your yep. domestic league championship, right? That's always number one goal and I'll be you know, quite happily putting my colours to the mast here. I'll take getting thumped out of every cup going as long as at the end of the season I'm standing with a league championship flag because that's the barometer, real barometer of success. Europe's slightly different, right, because it's glamorous and if you do it in the European stage, it means something else as well. But I think we should be comfortable that for the second year running, we'll have fully expect touch wood, cross fingers, all that kind of stuff. We'll have got into the knockout stages. After that, it's a bit of a lottery. As, as Dean, again, I keep referring to Dean's stories here because he's generally ahead of me uh, in terms of in terms of the points, to be honest with you, um, that, which I'm pretending I'm enjoying, but I'm obviously... I'm obviously <laughs> <laughs> but um, every time I turn with the ball, he just takes off it. <laughs> it's like, you know, you've, you've went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Benfica, one of the best team, a CL team, a Champions League team in that competition for this year. Yeah. And they've spent a lot of money to make sure that they are not in that next year, right? They've spent a lot of money to make sure they're CL again. So the players will be thinking we can go all the way. It's a lottery when you get into the knockout stages because it's, you know, that's the shootout, so to speak. Would I take going further than that and it having a detrimental impact on the league campaign? No, I, w I wouldn't. I'd take getting through it in the knockout stages, banking the check and making sure that I won the league championship. I'm, I'm absolutely never going to change my position about that. Unless we'd already won a championship the year before and somebody said you'll finish second and you'll win Europa League. Well, I might have a different conversation, but I'd like to get a championship. Steven Gerrard needs a championship as well. He does. Dean, do you think the players look at these European ties as almost just another game when, when you're in such a rich vein of form? Yeah, there's something special about playing in Europe. Um, hopefully the fans get back in their numbers very soon. There's nothing quite like European nights at, at, at Ibrox. Um, but at the moment, with the amount of games that there are because of the condensed um, the condensed season, you kind of football at the moment is game recovery preparation game. That's that's yeah. the cycle. So you are just on a roll. You're just kind of going from one game to the next game. So there's no time to really think about kind of okay this competition that competition. Every game is a winnable game at the moment. Rangers have a squad that is performing at a very very high level. They have a rotation. Um, which, as as you both mentioned, um, isn't having any negative effect on performance and results. So they'll be going into every game thinking it's winnable. So I don't think um, it's 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 not really that. I agree that with what uh, Tommy says that the the league is 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 the bread and butter. That's the most important. But there'll be players who are looking to prove a point in in the Europa League. There'll be players who are looking to prove a point in the cup competitions. And and why can't they? Why shouldn't Rangers be winning multiple trophies this season? Especially the form they're in, the squad they've got at the moment. Uh, they can definitely set their sights high on on winning multiple trophies. So Dean, I'm going to stay with you, and I'm going to ask you for a prediction. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think it'll go? For the season or for... for, for the no, give, give us a... Give, we'll have you back on before the end of the season. Don't worry about okay. that. Okay. Um, your prediction for Thursday? I think Rangers will have too much. I think the importance of this game is that get it done so that there's not the added pressure on the, the, the final game of the group. There's nothing quite like getting it done that you know you can go into the final game. You can maybe... The, the manager can possibly blood a few more youngsters. Yeah. Um 
give a few more players who haven't played more opportunity, the manager will be desperate to get it done um, at home, at Ibrox, uh, two, two nil victory um, and job done. Well played. Thomas? 3-1 victory. Well, I was going to say 3 nothing. I'm, I'm quietly confident. I didn't think... We went into the game at Standard Liège in Belgium and we thought, oh, these are a really... This lot are really, really good. They're very handy because they had this unbeaten sort of run behind them for years, by all accounts. I thought we made them look quite ordinary. I thought we played really well over there. And, um, I think it will be highlighted, obviously, with the wonderful goal that Roof scored right at the, at the death. Um, I'm quietly confident for Thursday night. As I say, I don't want to jinx it at all, so we might need to edit that out. Um, <laughs> right, well, I'll take anything as long as we get three points. I mean, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Dean, I'm going to come back to you. So this weekend, we travel to Dingwall to play Ross County, um, home of the giant killers, by all accounts. Um, we obviously <laughs> go up there on Sunday lunchtime, and Dingwall is in an area where fans will be allowed into the ground. How do you think the fans will accommodate the difference perhaps playing in a, a big 50,000 50, dollars seater with no one there to go into a smaller stadium with a certain amount of home support there? Will the, will the players almost block that out and just continue to, to do what they've been doing previously? Yes, it's interesting. I think the, the players will thrive off it. They'll thrive off a bit of atmosphere. They'll thrive off a bit of stick that they're going to get at a, at a hostile um, away ground. They will enjoy the, the fact that there's just not, you're not looking at blank seats. Yeah. Um, and that there will be an extra buzz around the game. We were at Carlisle, we were actually a test game a few months ago where we, we were allowed a thousand fans into the stadium. And it was okay. absolutely fantastic. It felt like there were far more than a thousand there. Um, they made the, the, the atmosphere. I, I mean, it's, it's weird because now we're used to playing behind closed doors, but with a thousand fans, it was fantastic. We were allowed to, uh, 2000 on Wednesday nights. So I'm very excited for that. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, you want to play uh, as a player. You want to play in front of an atmosphere. You you want you want the big occasion. You want there to be fans. You want there to be pressure. Otherwise, what what are we doing it for? And and I'm sure the players are only going to thrive off there being there being fans back in the stadium. I'm sure it, it's only a good thing. And and hopefully um, we're on the way to seeing more and more back in back on. In, in Ibrox and, and stadiums around the country. Here, here. Uh, Thomas, Ross County will be on a high from the, the obvious result at the weekend. Um, we should go up there with all due respect and just, we, we should go up and take care of them. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody has to, you know, um, do their job professionally. You know, they've, they've, uh, they've managed to get a, a result against a, a decent team uh, in, the, in the Premier League. Um, in the Cup. Yeah, decent a team coming in, in. but uh, I, I might um, edit that out. I don't want to. Uh, that's going to come back and bite me. I'm, I'm <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's like anything. You can't go up with any preconceptions. Yeah. You can't expect to roll over teams because they'll be playing for a life and trying to prove a point against a higher opposition and show why they are professional, why they should get a move to other clubs, etc. They want to do the best in front of their fans, getting back in. You know, everybody loves performing in front of people, um, by, by and large, and. Um, just caught myself there with that, uh, that, that statement, actually. I'm just, um, sorry, carry on podcast. The fact that both of you are figuring away, I know I'm on the same level. Um, so, yeah, okay, one for the editing room floor. But, yeah, and I think that it may have a, a, a big difference because it's the first time that those fans will be back in. And, you know, let's call a spade a spade here. Big club coming to town. These guys will want to raise their game and, and show. I think it's on the TV as well. Yes. Yeah, so the cameras are there. Everything that a player takes into account, I'd imagine, you know, I really want to showcase my talent. Fair enough. And it's not going to be in front of two angry seagulls or anything like that. This time, there's actually going to be people sitting in the in, in some of the seats. So, yeah, Rangers need to be professional. It'll be interesting to see if there's a similar rotation of the squad again. So, listen, before I let you go for the night, uh, Dean, you, will, you have a game on Wednesday night. Who are you entertaining on Wednesday? We are playing Salford on Wednesday. Uh, Gary game, Neville's team. Gary Neville's team. We're, they're a point behind us in the league. We okay. are seventh, I believe. They're just below us. Um, they've got a manager. 
Richie Willens, who yeah. I played with at Doncaster. So that was a good player as well, well, wasn't he? Richie, yeah. Richie was fantastic. Very yeah. the mo- him and Barry Ferguson are the two oh, most easy, players. easy yeah. now. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and incredible player. But he he could moan, um, <laughs> and 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 rich and Richie was on was was on a level. Um, so I'm interesting interested to see what he's like as a manager. Uh, he's been very successful at Swindon, so and he's got the job at Salford. He's he's from he's a Salford boy, um, and we've got two thousand fans back in the stadium. So very very excited for that, and hope we can uh, get our maintain our place in in those playoff positions. So listen, best of luck for Wednesday yeah. and, and for the rest of the season. Hope you have the, uh, you back on between and now and the end of the season and we can talk some more um, Rangers stuff. Look forward to getting you back on. Fantastic. Anytime. Thomas, um, we will do this all again next week. Look forward to that already. Um, two yeah. big games coming up this weekend. I, I think it will form us uh, quite well for granted December, a tricky month. Yeah, fixture congestion coming up. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. That um, look forward to doing it again next week. Was the least sincere you've been during this entire podcast recording? I should have smiled uh, after I said that. I knew I was doing something wrong. Exactly. Um, you know, Scott's our Barry Ferguson team. He's the money one. All <laughs> not thoroughly enjoyed it. And my thanks to Dean as well. It's uh, yeah, been a really good chat. Looking forward to the next time you're back on as well. So you'll yeah. get this pod available in all the obvious places: YouTube, Stitcher, Podbean. Acast, Apple Music, we're on there as well, and and Spotify, by all means, check it out. Leave us your fancy, preferably five-star ratings, and we will do it all again next week. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.